You're listening to Toronto's number one real estate podcast, powered by Watson Estates. The most successful local real estate investing starts right here, right now. Here's your host, broker, investor, and social media influencer, Bradley Watson. Good morning, investors. Bradley here from Watson Estates. Thank you for joining us once again for our daily podcast, keeping you guys informed on all the news going on in and around the GTA housing market. And we are number one in Google Podcasts for Toronto Real Estate. Thanks to you. Leave us a thumbs up. Leave us a comment. We're going to continue to keep you updated as COVID-19 happens, all the news that comes by, and giving a little bit of a unique real estate perspective along the way. Today, we've got some great stuff to cover. We're going to talk about this big article that came out of Now Toronto. It's the number one article of the day. How will working remotely reshape Toronto's office culture? I want to talk about some of the things they have to say about how offices will change in the city and what impact that will have moving forward in the commercial space. And then I want to get into this unique comparison and see what HPI suggests is happening with Toronto real estate prices and compare them against what cities that were measured across Canada by Zucasa, what regions are going up and what are going down, and maybe we can find some kind of conflict in those price reviews, right? Like our HPIs and average selling price different, and in fact they are, and I wanna talk about why they are and what that could mean and how we should really be looking at these numbers. And then would leaving the city be a better investment? Some people just kind of default to, you know what, screw it. I'm out of here, I'm leaving Toronto, I'm leaving the city, there's better investments elsewhere. Well, I wanna take a minute to look at those investments because maybe they are better for some people, but I still think we need to keep in mind some of the risks associated with leaving the city because there certainly are. Now, before I get it, go any further, I can't not mention the apology letter that was written by John Tory. Now, he had a nice little surprise visit to Trinity Bellwood, Bellwood Park, And this is all over the news. It looks almost like he got his hand stuck in the cookie jar and his mommy got mad at him and made him write a letter. If you haven't seen the apology letter, read it. It it feels weird. It feels like someone else wrote it. Like he's just like he I I picture this little kid walking up with a note that he has to read to his friends before he can go back on the playground. So check it out if you haven't read it already. But this is all over the news. It's plastered. I guess he got uh, pretty serious photo taken of him with his mask down talking to people i mean the cameras are on you man you got busted anyways so let's let's get into some of the news going on in the toronto real estate market let's let's keep this real estate oriented i just thought that was so noteworthy we had to mention it so let's talk about this idea of working remotely right we're starting to see this dynamic change kind of happening in the city People aren't commuting in to work anymore. They're staying from home. So this article from Now Toronto is called Home for Good? Working remotely will reshape Toronto's office culture. Commercial real estate is vulnerable as employers get comfy with work from home setups, but deeper social needs may trump the desire to downsize. What I find ironic is the companies, there's kind of, they talk about how there's a stay at home, like, experiment that's been going on we'll see in this article they call it they actually is royal LePage commercial realtor ryan henry said this is now the largest work from home experiment that has ever taken place and some companies are finding it's working better than they thought it would i love how people don't have any they think their employer because their employees are at home they're not going to get any work done that might be the case but i know for me personally i work from home i worked from home pre-covid and I am far more efficient. Like you guys are seeing, we're putting out daily podcasts, but that does not mean it's interfering with my work. And I've got a pregnant wife and we've got so much going on in my life here that working from home is actually a more effective way to get things done, especially when you consider the the commute times and all that. But finally, I think some businesses are starting to appreciate that people can actually get work done. And if they're not getting work done, hey, fire them, right? Get rid of them. And, and I think they're starting to realize it. So downtown Toronto has felt gutted in the past couple of months with stay at home orders hollowing out the city's office towers during the coronavirus pandemic. Walking through the streets, there's a nervous calm and a deceptive peacefulness. Deceptive peacefulness. When I actually got back from New York a few years back, we kind of traveled there. It was one of our trips. I came back and I, we, we took a bus, which is the worst thing ever. Never take a bus to New York. 10 hour bus ride. I get motion sickness too. I think it all started on that trip. But when we got back, we realized how quiet it was, right? This deceptive peacefulness. The feeling is a reminder that things are not well. 
If physical distancing continues, will big employers consider leasing out or abandoning their pricey office spaces, typically their biggest expense after wages? So this is kind of the premise of the whole article, right? Is are these and then it goes on to talk about some of them. So CEO of Twitter, who's been very vocal on this, and Merchant Service Square is making his work from home policy permanent. It's actually in red here, permanent, even after the COVID-19 pandemic subsides. Google and Facebook will keep their employees work remotely until at least 2021. Office centricity is over, is over, declared Shopify CEO, who's also been very vocal. On May 21st, he announced the Toronto tech company will keep offices closed until 2021 and prepare most employees to work from home permanently. Permanently. So these are not just things that we're kind of reflexing and think, oh, this is kind of cool. Maybe we'll kind of grab some of the people. No, these are permanent decisions. Now, of course, they're in the tech space, so maybe they're a little bit more fluid that way. They can pull the trigger on it. But interesting nonetheless, BMO and TD are entertaining blended or permanent remote options. So even ones who are not permanent or, or pulling everybody off the office space, they're at least considering these options because why not, right? If you're gonna remain competitive and you can get away with it, why not? If CIBC is entertaining remote work arrangements, how does that affect CIBC Square? The twin towers being built as replacement headquarters at Bay and Front by Ivanhoe Cambridge and Heinz. My wife Sandra actually worked at Ivanhoe Cambridge, so I am acutely aware of that project. I heard about it coming down the pipes and it's kind of, it's right on, right there, Bay and Front. And you guys have probably seen the development if you've been in and down near the city, which probably hasn't been recently, but it's been going on pre-COVID as well. But like we've got, this tower is going to be massive. It's going to be huge. And they're, well, like what happens with that, right? Like, first of all, are they going to be able to find tenants for it? I like to think they've already done that. They usually grab the tenants before they begin the construction of it. But Ultimately, we've seen declines, a lot of people who work in offices talking about how there's been shifts globally, even pre-COVID. In fact, they interviewed this guy, Al Beruzan. He is the commercial broker at Remax and founder of CEO behind Bosani Developments. And he says, even before Corona, I saw it as a dead industry. Talking about offices will suffer. Watching global shifts in wealth and trends, Beruzan expects a movement away from retail and office spaces. He doesn't see an economic crash in all of this, but a transfer of power. Some billionaires will go bankrupt while new billionaires emerge. And he gives examples of, you know, some of these luxury umbrella companies and they'll go down. Meanwhile, Jeff Bezos and Amazon is going to inherit that billion dollar business, right? Like the money is just switching from one hand to another. And he sees a physical shift, a decentralization away from downtown with more people moving an hour or so out of the city. And we'll talk about what this would look like as well. Purchasing lake houses to comfortably work from home while earning 250 from companies like Google or Amazon. He's developing residential neighborhoods and places like Aurelia for that reason. So he's putting his money where his mouth is and he's investing in these small communities. Aurelia is a great investment city, by the way, too. Lots of great cash flow opportunities. I've been looking at it really for years. It makes me wonder if it's actually not as great anymore because we've been watching it for so long. It's kind of suspicious, you know? A lot of companies have been leaving the suburbs and coming downtown because of the young talent pool. Before COVID-19, Toronto had the lowest commercial vacancy rate in North America at 2.2%. And then he goes on to talk about like these tech companies, right? Like we know, and we've done videos and articles about this before, Toronto is synonymous with tech. We are tech. That, there's a reason Google City or Google, whatever you want to call it, Sidewalk Labs was deciding Toronto as its kind of place to, to experiment with its, with its smart city. And it's because we have a, a huge pool of talent, right? And through a form of immigration and young people, we are cheap because the Canadian dollar is low relative to the American dollar. And we have, everything has kind of started moving here. Like there's a trend towards tech in Toronto and in the GTA. He points to Google leasing 400,000 square feet of office space on King Street. Apple moved office from Markham to Bremner Boulevard Tower that also houses Amazon. Meanwhile, Microsoft currently located in Mississauga is planning to move into CIBC Square. So we see all these big players in the city. And if anything, those would be the ones you want to watch, right? Because they are the most likely, from what we've seen, others do, to be able to pull, pull their office space out from underneath office towers now if you're like me you don't invest in office spaces like i don't i don't invest in commercial i i just don't touch commercial i think residential is far more profitable and even though you're thinking residential these days is taking a slamming just look at the commercial space 
Now, that's not to say you can't make big money. There are big players. Maybe I'm not big enough. You can make that argument as well. There are big price tags and big returns in that space, but it's also a lot slower and it's just different, right? I, I specialize in the residential side and so do many people who listen to our podcast here. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be paying attention to what's going on because this dynamic of whether to be in the city or outside the city should really be the decision on where we put our money to invest residentially as well. Like it follows, right? Especially when you start to see damage getting hit on things like the TTC and people not being willing to commute as far, right? In, amidst a pandemic. So then they kind of go, talk about this idea of reconfiguring and they're talking about how 20 years ago, I didn't know this, a typical organization calculated that they had between 200 to 225 square feet per person in a typical office. But with the more modern office layouts, they're down to about 75 square feet per person. So if we have to radically increase the square foot per person again, then that would kind of be a bit of a reversal to something that maybe we saw before. So then there's this kind of counter argument. I don't buy it as much, I'll be honest with you, but there's a counter argument that, well, we were kind of, we were allowing everyone to work in these kind of community office spaces, which are the ones that are mostly staying at home now because you can't have that. So if we expand that back to what we originally had, maybe you're gonna need more office space again. I think it's a weak failing argument, but that's fine. We'll look at it from both angles. You you be the judge. Then they talk about TTC and this idea that transit systems will collapse. Listen to this. If social distancing remains a reality, the people must avoid packing uncomfortably close together into subways and streetcars. Bridge feels that the transit system will collapse. So when you go to Manhattan, you're up to 85 or 90%. This is talking about things that I'm most worried about. People are going to about riding transit. Well over half the people working in downtown in Toronto are in transit and then that's the Manhattan 85 to 90 percent. So we have a huge ridership of our public transit which is getting completely spanked right now. And you guys know, I think it was on Saturday we were talking about this. This is a very important article. The more I think about it, the more I'm thinking about doing this as our weekly video, this idea of municipalities and how bad they're struggling. But one of the threats, kind of quote unquote threats, but it's not really a threat. It's a warning, if anything, from John Tory was this idea that TTC's budget would be slashed by $575 million, cutting its service in half if the province and federal government doesn't step up with financial aid. And they talk about here, where is this? A 5% drop in ridership would be the nail in the coffin since most transit operating budgets were already stretched thin before COVID-19. So if that's true, Right. So they're talking about like significant declines in Toronto, New York and London, these big global cities. If it is true, if we were to take that as gospel, the 5% drop in ridership would be a nail in the coffin for transit. Well, call it a nail in the coffin for transit. Right. Like I can almost guarantee I would bet so much money on that. I, that that's a, almost a sure bet. A drop in ridership, at least for the next year or two, by 5%. That's nothing. So, so they are severely threatened, of course, without aid. But anyways, all of this to say, we've got this kind of dilemma happening right now in office spaces. And I think w- before we look at prices and before we look at what it means to invest outside the city, let's just appreciate that there's going to be a, a huge change in that. And whatever the decision is to do, like if the decision is bring everybody back, we'll figure out the transit and we'll, we'll get it all sorted out, bring them back into the city then it will go back to how it kind of looked. But if the decision is to start working more more remotely, then I would say that that's a bet on the outskirts of Toronto. Not to discourage investing in Toronto, because I still think that that will generally outperform, but that is definitely a thumbs up to the neighboring communities across the GTA. Now I want to transition and I want to look at this idea of the HPIs. Now, there was an HPI release called the National Bank of Canada House Price Index, Terranet National Health Bank Canada, so they call it the TNBC HPI, and I was like, this is the first time I've actually heard of this particular HPI. I know about the Canadian real estate HPI. The big difference is this HPI measures based on the land registry data for the transaction. So once the deal closes, then their HPI kind of kicks in. So it's a little bit more delayed, but it's more comprehensive because if you don't have closings happening, like if they're falling through, which isn't a significant amount, by the way, but if they do, that would be updated in these in these stats. That's kind of how this actually came out of a better dwelling. So they like to give the counter argument, which is a good point. I do think it's important to note that. Whereas the Korea and the local boards ones that they use, 
they do it the moment it's entered into MLS. So it's in, in theory, it comes quicker, but it's less accurate. So I, but again, the accuracy is not all that different. So, but anyways, still valuable to consider this HPI, especially when we look at the numbers. Canadian home price accelerate, but that could come to an end soon. The C11, a price index of Canada's 11 largest markets, showed a substantial movement last month. Prices increased 1.35% in April when compared to the previous month. Compared to the same month last year, prices are now 5.27 higher percent. So we are seeing an increase as, as it relates to the HPI. We'll cover what that means in a minute. NBC noted the increase for April was unusually high, being twice the average gain for the past 10 Aprils. So not only are we growing, we are doubling the average over the last year. And this is not like pre-COVID. This is April. This is in April. This is during the COVID. So wait, wait a minute. So how are we seeing any reference of increases in price? Just hang on for one second. We'll get there. Six out of 11 of the cities reached new all-time highs, according to the index. They warned this could change with the economy approaching a recession. So that's the disclaimer. That's the better dwelling disclaimer. Of course, things can change. That's always the case. So the index for Toronto showed the biggest gains across Canada. The index increased 1.99% in April. It's almost two and is up 8.19% from last year. So prices on an HPI basis are up over 8% year over year. The report adds that high unemployment levels could mean homeowners are unable to meet mortgage payments. This could spark a flood of inventory, which in their opinion could mean downward pressure on home prices. Okay, again, anything can happen, right? Especially with the concerns we've got going on, and we talk about those as well. Like we know there's big risks involved right now. But let's talk a little bit before we kind of transition into the average prices, because I'm going to warn you, the average prices are negative, right? They're negative. In fact, they talk about, they point to these areas. I don't even know if it was in here that I just mentioned, but the article mentioned both Toronto and Ottawa as cities that were doing pretty good in the HPIs. But when we look at the average price, they're both down. In fact, they're some of the most negatively, how do you even say that? The prices are most impacted in a downwards direction by those cities. And the reason for this discrepancy is the HPI does not, it is based on housing type. So in theory, your your townhome would, if the townhome's a two bedroom townhome in this area goes down, then the HPI will go down. But if the average home price in general, so we're talking everything from a small little condo with a, a bachelor all the way up to uh, to Drake's mansion, if those if those home prices come down, then that would affect your average price. But it wouldn't affect the HPI, right? Because if Drake decides not to sell his home this month. All of a sudden, our HPI is going to be way higher than our average. If that, hopefully, that makes sense. So the HPI is truly a more real way of calculating the price. It's just it's funny because on a, an increase, we do tend to see the average price being thrown around because the average price seems more sexy in a good market because the more expensive homes are going up and they're selling and they kind of increase, they inflate the price a little bit. But there's this article that came out of Narcity, which I definitely wanted to mention. And it was talking, you'll hear a, a stark contrast between the last article we heard, but it's very interesting to note. Houses are getting cheaper across Canada, except in seven regions where prices keep going up. So this article talks about where there's kind of been uh, a bit of a, a beat down on prices, but also an increase in prices. So it kind of talks about like what, what's going on in general and it names cities. And I'm gonna just point out the, the major cities. No one cares about every city, but I'll give you the, the highlights. The average house price in Canada has dropped by 10% during the pandemic. So that's the average across Canada. Again, price in, in prices. And based on this analysis, Zucasa, a full service brokerage, shared its analysis. What they did was they measured 20 real estate markets across the country using data from the Canadian Real Estate Association. So for any of you who are like, screw you, real estate agents, I don't believe a word you say. Well, if you believe Zucasa, which, I mean, I guess they're a full service brokerage, but if you want to go outside of what we're saying and you want to take out, ultimately they end up using the same stats. Like we're all using the same stats. So it's just, it comes back down to the, who's doing the analysis, I guess, and who's making the comment at the end. With Canada as a whole, that average dropped 10% across those 20 cities. Of the 20 real estate markets looked at by Zucasa, 13 have seen a decrease in prices. Greater, listen to this, Greater Toronto, is the only region to have its average home price drop by more than $50,000. 
Interesting point, but also keep in mind because the price tag is higher, a $50,000 drop in Toronto isn't as extreme on a percentage basis, but still an interesting point nonetheless. And Ottawa, they also saw decreases. So Ottawa, Hamilton, Burlington, Niagara, Windsor, Essex, and Calgary saw decreases between 25 to 50,000. So there are some Ontario cities there. And after those markets, we saw London, right? London is mad affordable, right? People think, oh, London, like I'm going to go further out because it's cheaper and the home prices are going to do better. Kitchener, Waterloo also saw smaller decreases, but they still saw decreases. So don't think that you can kind of hide behind these smaller cities when the prices are fluctuating. They just won't fluctuate as much. Greater Vancouver, though, will see price increases of up to 25000 there wasn't any Ontario cities mentioned in this survey, by the way, in this analysis that showed growth. So now keep in mind, they didn't interview. They didn't not interview. You can't interview a city. Excuse me, Mr. Ottawa. Come here for a moment. Actually, Mr. Ottawa, Mr. Ottawa would be Justin Trudeau. Anyways, so th this analysis was only for these major cities, obviously. But even with a decrease because of COVID-19, Toronto and the sur surrounding region have one of the highest average home prices in the country, of course. And we also have the highest rent in the country as well. So an interesting point, recognize that the HPIs are showing very good numbers, they're up 8% in Toronto. But when we look at the average prices, we're seeing significant decline. So depending on what article you're reading, you're going to get very confusing news. But they both tell the same story. And that story, to me... This is what I read. Maybe there's some more to it. If you guys have any other insights on what the, would be the cause of this, my reasoning for this has been and will continue to be that the homes on the high end don't, the high end homes are not selling. They're not wanting to sell because they're not willing to sacrifice on price. And there's a perception that it's expensive and it's a bad market. Your price is going to come down the most. I want to buy your home. And so they're not selling because they don't need to. There hasn't been a, pr a pressure for them to list their home. And therefore, the HPI numbers remain high because inventory by type is, is increasing in price, but in as a whole is dropping average because the high-end stuff's not selling. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, I don't know what's going to help you at this point. I think I've explained that three times. But we're going to move on. So then there becomes this conflict. We got, we've, got this, we've got a bunch of investors that listen to our podcast, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully you guys are learning. Hopefully you guys are making bank off your investments during this time, or at least in a position to make a purchase during this time. And that's not to hint my investment strategy, but our big investors are buying. So now run out and sell, maybe not so much, but I would be encouraging people to buy right now because there is certainly a dip in the market. So let's talk about this difference between cash flow and equity, right? So, so the city, the equity in Toronto. Okay, so you just dropped fifty thousand dollars on average in Toronto. So that kind of means maybe it's not so good. Some people would think maybe Toronto's not a good investment. I would argue it's a it's a great time to buy because it's a fifty thousand dollar discount. And it sounds good to me. Imagine getting a fifty thousand dollar discount on oranges at the grocery store. People would be lining up outside. Actually, they're already lining up outside. The line would just be twice as long, but equally distanced. So let's talk about what, so some of these investors might be considering, okay, well, let's go outside the city. Let's look at cash flow, right? Let's, let's get a more cash flow based environment, maybe more stable. There's going to be some more renters that are able to work from home. Sounds like a good deal, right? Well, first thing we need to point out is something we've been talking about in the past. We talked about this, I think a couple of days ago as well. A lot of Toronto renters can't get by, even with the CERB, they need to top up from the feds. So this idea of the CEERB for a single person is not enough sufficient for the average rental in Toronto. But I would argue, even if you go just outside of Toronto into the GTA, those rentals are still expensive and 2000 does not go far enough. Like the CEERB is not necessarily designed to, to match for a single person rent. It's just not equipped to do that. And so this is where it kind of comes to this feud between landlords and tenants. But I digress. Let's move over here because there's some people would look at a place like London. We saw that London had that one of the lower price declines. And so they had an article that was published by the London Free Press. And I think it's important that we hear the news that's coming out of those smaller cities as well, because I think we just assume that things are significantly better there. But that would be a false assumption. Listen to this. London post-secondary schools pandemic-driven plans to mix online and in-person learning this fall are creating uncertainty in the student rental housing market, landlords say. The pandemic saw average rent in London tumble 11.3% in April, the first drop in years, according to National Rental Adver Advertising and Tracking Website Rentals.ca. 
in Toronto, we've seen decreases in rent by single digits. Whereas in London, they're seeing rents dropping by double digits. Now, granted, this is the first time in years, but you could make that same argument in Toronto. Like we haven't seen prices coming down, rentals coming down in price in years. Like this is across the board. So the, the places that on paper would seem like better cash flow investments are actually taking a bigger hit as far as rent goes. Now, of course, there's still more there's still more money there in cash flow. Don't get me wrong, but don't feel like because you're running outside the city, all of a sudden the 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 grass is greener. It's not true. That hesitation reflects students not knowing whether it's worth it for them to move to London for school. They're more concerned about, hey, if my program goes fully online, maybe I do not need to be here anymore come September, right? If you can, which is funny because I feel like people go to London because they want that university experience, get away from their parents, but now they're like, hey, maybe I can save on residents. Anyways, that's a that's a blanket statement. Everyone has their own motives, but nevertheless, what percentage of them, what percentage of that won't be coming back? We don't know. They say there are 50,000 students come to London in a typical year. So these cities, especially, I mean, based on this article, the ones that, that need housing for students, they are struggling. And I would assume that that would be the case. We saw Kitchener Waterloo decreasing in price too. I would assume it's the same there. Like any place where you would expect an influx of students that are not going to come this September, I'll bet you there's a bunch that won't. A lot of them won't be in residence as well. So you can argue because they're non-residents, maybe there's some more rentals. But again, I think that's a weak argument next to the overall amount of students that won't be on campus. He expects average rent to continue to slip in the next few months before settling into more balanced growth in the second half of 2020. Sounds very much like Toronto, guys. Sounds very much like Toronto. So if there's one thing, actually, if there's two things that I've learned today, just reading through some of this news, and hopefully you've learned it as well, it's number one, the pandemic is widespreading in the real estate market. You can't hide from it from running outside the city. In fact, I would argue perhaps the city is your best investment because prices are down so much. And I wouldn't say to be selling right now. Some people think, oh, you're a realtor, so you're buying, you're selling, you get all the money from the commission. So don't even, even if you're not using me, these are the things that you guys should be keeping in mind. I'm, I'm trying to educate you guys. I'm not telling you to run out and sell right now. I don't think people should be selling right now. I think prices are going to go up. I think that bidding wars are going to continue. I think the buy, this time to sell is coming soon. But I definitely think that the time to buy is fading, if not already faded. It is, it is a very good time to purchase properties that are heavily discounted. And the second thing that I'm learning today is to avoid Trinity Bellwood Park because I don't want my mama getting pissed at me making me write letters. I'll see you guys tomorrow bright and early with some more. I hope you guys had a great time with us and I look forward to sharing more. We are number one on Google Podcast for Toronto Real Estate. Take care and keep it real.